Someone once said that the most important thing in life is always to remember the most important thing. Remembering the most important thing. We all have moments of forgetfulness, lapses of memory, very common. Most often not a particularly big deal, not a real earth-shattering problem. It's kind of like the old story of the farmer standing in the field holding a piece of rope in his hand, unable to remember if he had just found a rope or had lost a cow. Um, Generally, forgetfulness simply results in a little bit of confusion and embarrassment. It's no big deal. However, there are those times when lapses of memory can be devastating. Preacher Tom Ewell writes, When I was a young student in seminary, one day I happened to hear that a very famous preacher would be preaching at a nearby church. That Sunday, I raced over to hear him speak. It was an extremely hot and heavy summer morning, and because of the heat, unfortunately, not even this this great preacher was able to keep the congregation's attention. People were staring out the windows. They were falling asleep. Sensing that he was losing his audience, the great preacher suddenly paused in the middle of his sermon and in a loud, clear voice abruptly announced, I have spent some of the best moments of my life in the arms of another man's wife. Needless to say, with that, the whole congregation suddenly sat bolt upright. Did he say what I think I heard him say? It can't be. It's terrible. It's outrageous. Seeing that he had regained their attention, the great preacher then added, that woman was my mother. And everyone chuckled, and the sermon then continued, and now with everyone's close attention on the message. As I sat there that Sunday, I thought to myself, now that's a great trick. I gotta, gotta store that away. I gotta remember that one, right? Well, many years later, I was serving my own church. One Sunday morning, it was an extremely hot and heavy summer morning, and because of the heat, I was unable to keep the congregation's attention. They were staring out the windows, they were falling asleep. Suddenly, that great old preacher's trick came to mind. I paused in my sermon, and in a loud, clear voice, I abruptly announced, I have spent some of the best moments of my life in the arms of another man's wife. With that, the whole congregation suddenly sat bolt upright. Did he say what I think he said? It can't be. It's terrible. It's outrageous. Having regained their attention, suddenly, however, I realized that I was now unable to remember the punchline (laughs) to the joke. The congregation stared at me and I at them for what seemed like an eternity until finally seeing no way out, I just quietly said, unfortunately, for the life of me, I can't remember who the woman was. <laughs> Certain lapses of memory can be fatal. Right? This is what I'd like to talk about this morning, remembering. Particularly, the most important thing we must remember always because our lives depend upon it. Today we conclude our summertime series uh, with the parable of the two debtors. And one final time, Jesus tells a very simplistic, almost transparent story But as so often happens, what makes the story particularly powerful is the setting in which it's told. Jesus is having dinner with Simon the Pharisee, presumably one of the foremost religious leaders in town. Now, we don't know exactly why Simon is holding this dinner party, whether he's a genuine seeker of faith, whether he's just entertaining, you know, the latest pop phenomenon, or whether he's an opponent seeking a a chance to discredit Jesus. But whatever, Jesus, who has proven himself willing to eat with whomever invites him, sinner and holy man, friend and foe alike, is there. You see, Jesus is a, is a classic preacher. He goes wherever the food is free, right? Well, the party's going along fine uh, when suddenly this, this woman breaks into the gathering and she rushes over to Jesus and crying. She kneels at his feet, anointing them with oil. Talk about putting a, a damper, you know, on, on the festivities. A serious breach of decorum, to say the least, not only because at such a gathering the, the women were supposed to keep separate from the men, but even more because, as seems to be well known by everybody in attendance, this woman is a sinner, right? Her specific sins are not identified, but it appears to be commonly understood that this woman has led a very corrupt and dissolute life. Simon is livid at this disruption, not only because of the the, the breach of proper etiquette, but even more because, as far as he can tell, this proves that Jesus is not a man of God. I mean, after all, if he really were a godly man, a prophet sent from heaven, he would know what kind of woman this is, and he would reject her. He would cast her out. I mean, that's what holy people do, right? 
Well, in response, however, Jesus doesn't directly answer this charge, but instead, revealing just what a true man of God he is, how deeply he understands what's really going on right within people's own hearts, he counters with a story, our final parable. Two people, each with a a debt owed to a creditor. The first, over a year's wages, and the second, about a month's wages. Neither is able to pay, so the creditor forgives both debts, writes them off free and clear. Which debtor, do you suppose, Jesus asks, will love the creditor more? Simon sheepishly answers, I guess the one who was forgiven more. Jesus replies that he has answered correctly, and then he goes on to note how the parable itself is being played out right in their gathering together. It is a living parable. Simon, who offered not even the most fundamental of common courtesies to Jesus upon his arrival as a guest at his home, who demonstrated no love, while the woman, overflowing with affection and courtesy and hospitality, overflowing with love. And why? Because it seems she has heard Jesus' message of complete forgiveness and has taken it to heart. While Simon is not aware of anything forgiven or anything in him that even needs forgiving. And this, you see, is the real message in all this. Not simply that the woman has somehow sinned more than than Simon and thus is able to love Jesus more. Kind of like, you know, to really love God, you have to sin a whole bunch. No, that doesn't even make sense, right? But rather that what really separates the woman and Simon and causes her life to be now on such a good path while his life is on such a bad one is that she is aware of just how much he has been forgiven by God while Simon is not. That is the real point is that like the debtors in the parable, both Simon and the woman are sinners each in their own way. She in her corrupt lifestyle, he in his self-righteousness. But one is far more aware of their forgiveness in point of fact. One, one sees only this and the other sees it not at all, you know. With the end result being that the one who is consumed by this profound sense of her forgiveness, who has this one thought driving her above all else, is practically being pushed by it, shoved by it into a great life. While the other, without this, is having such a life almost slip from his grasp. Note the contrasting result at the dinner. Simon, angry, judgmental, stingy, grudging. The woman, joyful, overflowing, thankful, loving. And this is my simple message for us here this morning at the close of this series, that what Jesus finally teaches us here is that one of the the final key elements of a great life, of a life of joyful, uh, overflowing, and thankful, and loving right on target with what God is doing and and once done life the way it should be, is meant to be, rather than angry and judgmental and stingy and grudging and miserable and all that, you know, and lost, is that for those who have experienced the forgiving love of Jesus Christ, to have a constant, strong awareness of this, a heart set on its forgiveness in Christ. That in effect is played out symbolically in the text. We tend to so often and so easily to lose sight of just how much we have been forgiven and the cost and the tremendous gift of that forgiveness. And when this happens, life as it should be, it slips our grasp. And that the key to getting our lives going right again and keeping them going right is to keep our hearts centered on our forgiveness in Jesus Christ to remember always forefront in our hearts and minds, driving us, guiding us, shaping us. Final simple message of this series. Remember the most important thing. That in the midst of all the different things we've talked about in this series, or or ever will talk about, it all ultimately comes down to just this, remembering our forgiveness in Christ. The foremost secret to a truly blessed life. To make this the one thing we think about continually, as much as we possibly can, but most especially at a number of prime moments that I'd just like to highlight as we close out this series. First, to remember our forgiveness in Christ, to bring it to mind, forefront, when angry. One of the first times when it's vital to put thoughts of our own experience of Christ's mercy foremost in our minds is when someone hurts us. When somebody wrongs us, when we're angry, we want to lash out, you know, get even, judge, condemn, reject, you know. To think instead first, how has Christ forgiven me? To put this, this thought up front and to allow that to guide us, you know. Not that we don't stand up to evil and injustice and confront wrong, you know, just be doormats or something, let ourselves be hurt, but rather simply, are we being as compassionate and merciful to others as Christ has been to us? You know, I remember once hearing a fellow pastor, he told a story 
that when he was in seminary, one day his theology professor gave the class the following assignment. At the front of the class, classroom, there were pieces of paper stuck to the wall, and each student was to go forward and draw on one of the pieces of paper a picture of their worst enemy, like a, a character of it, some sort of symbolic representation of the person they least liked, who most annoyed them, and, and most got on their nerves. The professor then handed out darts, you know, and instructed the students to throw the darts at the, at, the, at the picture of their enemy. The class had a whole bunch of fun with this. It seemed like a great way to, to vent one's aggression and one's anger, and there were lots of laughing and joking as the darts flew everywhere, you know. But when all the darts had been thrown and the class sat down, the professor then went, went and he removed the darts, and he turned over all the pieces of paper to reveal that on the back of each picture, of each picture was a picture of the classic representation of Jesus Christ. His face, now all torn and broken and abused. And needless to say, a hush fell over the classroom. The professor then opened his Bible and read, Whatever you do to one of the least of these, you do to me. He then closed his Bible and said, Class dismissed. And as this pastor then concluded, this experience had a profound effect on him. There's barely a day that passes that he doesn't return to this. When someone annoys him, hurts him, when he's ready to judge and to condemn, he asks, what am I doing to Jesus in this? And and, and to what Christ has done for me? First prime moment to remember one's forgiveness in Christ when angry. The second, when tempted. Another crucial time to think about how much Christ has forgiven you to put a forefront in your mind is when you're tempted. Really, when, when making any kind of a decision but particularly when there's something you're thinking about doing that you know you probably shouldn't do, but you're rationalizing, you know, you're making up excuses, you're tempted, to ask instead simply, will this honor or dishonor what Christ has done for me? To put thoughts of one's forgiveness in, of, of Christ forefront and then let those thoughts guide you and, and strengthen your resolve. A noted biblical scholar puts it this way. If a child is playing with a toy you don't want him to have, how can you get it away from him? Take it by force, and he'll cry for hours. The better way is to distract his attention by interesting him in something else. Then, while his attention is diverted, you can take the toy away, and he won't even notice. Curiously, this is exactly the way temptation works. It seeks to distract us, to divert our attention, and take from us while we look away. The trick, obviously, is to keep our attention focused in the right place. Keep our attention focused in the right place. If we want to keep our lives going well, we need to live this lesson. When tempted to some behavior or to some substance or to some action, when drawn to, to, to take that drink or, or to, to say that hurtful word or, or to throw up our hands in despair or, or to hold tight to that grudge, to keep our attention focused instead on all that Christ has forgiven us, that, that is the, the noble, valuable life he sees in us and has given his own life for, and to live only that higher, that, that precious image of us, you know? Are we doing this? When we do amazing things happen instead of the all-too-ordinary things that all-too-ordinarily happen. Author Richard James, in his book, A Million Ways to Die, offers the following reflection. He writes, The city of Cairo has its own unique version of poverty called Garbage City. Each morning at dawn, some 7,000 garbage collectors on horse carts leave for Cairo, where they collect the garbage left behind by the city's 7 million citizens. After their day's work, they return to Garbage City, bringing the trash back to their homes, sorting out what's useful. In Muslim countries, there are certain religious restrictions on sifting through refuse, so the inhabitants of Garbage City are either non-religious or from some Christian heritage. These are the poorest of the poor, outcasts among outcasts. In 1972, a young, wealthy Egyptian businessman lost his wristwatch, valued at roughly $11,000. As you could imagine, it would have been unthinkable to have a valuable timepiece returned by a member of Garbage City. Yet an old Garbage City man, dressed in rags, found the watch, and seeing the man's name engraved upon it, returned it, saying, My Christ told me to be honest until death. With all that he has done for me, how could I do anything less? In a worldly sense, it would have made a lot more sense for the poor man to keep the watch. He could have turned his life around by the money he would have gotten for that. But you see, he was focused on higher things, right? He was aiming there. As Jesus said, for what does it profit a person to gain the whole world but to forfeit their soul? 
Author James concludes, because of the garbage man's act of obedience, the Egyptian businessman later told a reporter, quote, I didn't know Jesus Christ at the time, but I told the garbage man that I saw Christ in him. I told him, because of what you have done and your great example, I will now worship the Christ you are worshiping. The businessman, true to his word, studied the Bible and grew in his faith. Soon he and his wife began ministering to Egypt's physically and spiritually poor. In 1978, he was ordained by the Coptic Orthodox Church and now leads a church that meets right outside Garbage City. It's the amazing power that's unleashed when we choose the way of Christ over the ways of this world that are always tugging against us, right? Second prime moment to remember one's forgiveness in Christ when tempted. In everything, ask, what am I about to do? Will this honor what Christ has done for me and what he sees in me? From this, then, the third prime moment to remember Christ's mercy is when failed. Building on all this, still another crucial time to come back to one's forgiveness in Christ and to put it forefront is simply when you louse up, right? Particularly when you're trying so hard to do your best, when you're trying to be good, when you're striving for greatness, say say as a spouse or as a parent, as a disciple or a friend, you know, and you fail. You know, there's a tendency in such situations when we, louse, when we louse things up, when we slip and fall, we, we want to just give up, right? But you see, this is the third crucial time to come back and to remember one's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. To remember that God's nature is to be forgiving and thus to remember that failure with God is not the end. God is the God of the second chance. God is the God of the third, the endless chance, you know? They just keep trying again. As it has been said, falling down doesn't make you a failure, but staying down does. How have you failed lately? Maybe you're kicking yourself right here this morning, thinking it's all hopeless. One author writes, You have failed many times, although you may not remember. You fell down the very first time you tried to walk. You almost drowned the first time you tried to swim, didn't you? Did you hit the ball the very first time you swung the bat? Life consists of failure. But somewhere along the line, we come to convince ourselves that failure is terminal. But the God of the cross and the empty tomb wants us to remember always that failure is not the end. To instead get back up and try again and again and again. All nature shouts of this beginning again God who can make all our failures regenerative. The one who is rising again, who never tires of of fresh starts, second chances, nativities, renaissances in persons or in culture. God is a God of starting over, of genesis and regenesis. Don't put a period where God has only put a comma. Oscar Wilde once sarcastically said, always remember, every day is another chance to get it all wrong. Right? It's sarcastic, but a point well made. It's not about succeeding or failing. It's about getting back up and trying again. Don't put a period where God has only put a comma. Third prime moment to remember one's forgiveness in Jesus Christ when failed. Remember and get back up again. All of which brings us to fourth and finally what is probably the most important time of all to think about our forgiveness in Christ, put it forefront in our lives, namely when empty. Simply put, as demonstrated in our text this morning, Simon is annoyed and irritated and grudging while the woman is joyful and thankful and abundant. You know, Now think about that. Picking up on what we, what we considered last week, which one of these two best describes your life most often? Annoyed, irritated, and grudging, or joyful, thankful, and abundant? If your life has become a kind of empty, annoying, irritated drudgery, could, could it perhaps be because, like Simon the Pharisee, you have lost sight of what life is about, particularly for those in Christ? Namely, to acknowledge and to res- respond to the forgiveness of God which we have all received and which surrounds us continually, to overflow with this? Like the forgiven woman to witness to and to express and to share your experience of forgiveness in Christ, to let that flow out of you, to make that what your whole life is about? That is plainly stated, if your life, if your life often stinks, right? If more often than not your heart becomes overwhelmed by troubles and obstacles and pain and difficulties, think about God's forgiveness of you in Christ Jesus. Put that forefront in your mind. Make that what your whole life is about, above all else, every day. Not your issues, but that amazing grace. And witness to that. Share it. Offer it to somebody else. Overflow with it. Get in on the grace business, and it will all come rushing right back to you with life. 
every moment of every day, simply look around for someone who needs this grace, this forgiveness, and offer to them. And watch what happens for both of you. One preacher writes, My six-year-old son used one of those super adhesive glues on a model airplane that he was building. In less than three minutes, his right index finger was bonded securely to the shiny blue wing of a DC-10. He tried to free it. He tugged. He pulled at it. Like a cat with tape stuck to its paw, he waved it frantically, you know. But he couldn't budge his finger free. Finally, he came to me for help. As tears began to well up in his eyes out of frustration and embarrassment and stupidity, I I worked hard not to laugh. And as I looked at him, I suddenly remembered the scene when I had visited a new family in our neighborhood a few nights earlier. The father of the family introduced his children this way. He said, this is Pete. He's the clumsy one of the lot. That's Kathy coming in with mud on her shoes. She's the sloppy one. And as always, Mike's last. He'll be late for his own funeral, I can tell you. This dad did a thorough job of gluing his children to their faults and to their mistakes. I didn't want that to happen here. So as my son and I talked, I, unbeknownst to him, reached over and stuck my hand into my computer printer, which was in the process of printing my Sunday sermon. As tears began to flow from my son's eyes, he finally held out his hand glued to the airplane wing, and I reached out to take hold of it with the hand I had been concealing, which was now covered with black ink and randomly printed words. My son looked at my hand in amazement. Seeing his shock, I replied nonchalantly, you know, only truly great people put their whole selves into whatever they're doing. My son looked at me and smiled. I got some solvent for the two of us. Oh, and by the way, today my son is all grown up and he designs airplanes for a living. (laughs) Rest assured, somebody today, every single day, right near you, somebody you're going to come in contact with, needs, desperately needs to know forgiveness, needs to know God's forgiveness in Jesus Christ. Remember your own and overflow with it and find life. The most important thing is always to remember the most important thing. This is where we finally conclude this series. In a reminder to be continually aware of the mercy shown to us in Jesus Christ, to think about this, to put it forefront in our hearts and minds always, the key to a great life. When angry, when tempted, when failed, when empty, whenever, wherever, always, remember the most important thing. You are forgiven in Jesus Christ. Let us join together in singing our closing hymn, number 370 in the red hymnal, Victory in Jesus. Would you please stand? Thank you.